so I, according to my SD card, I can record up to 2,021 hours of sounds. So I'm hoping we're not going to go on That's that long. Fingers crossed. Oh, I don't know. Five yeah. interpreters. Once they get started, you know. <laughs> I can make a really bad dad joke, and that's called being smart. That is totally fine. JD, it's a pandemic. You gotta do what you gotta do. Well, especially if it's with that really strong Scottish accent, nobody will understand it anyway. (laughs) I don't. So funny. I don't have an accent. It's everyone else's. No, but like, put it on. I mean, come on. I can put on the Bavarian. (laughs) You want New York? I don't think so. (laughs) I'm talking, (laughs) yes. I'm talking here. I'm walking here. Hey, I'm walking here. The silliest warm-up session we've ever done, I think. Let's go. (laughs) You can try, Jonathan. This is Troublesome Terps, the podcast about the things that keep interpreters up at night. And we have a full complement of fantastic people here, including the uh, the only interpreter about whom I've ever said, I can't believe she's not German, Sarah Hickey. <laughs> not Irish, sorry. Hey, yeah, actually, I am German. <laughs> Irish by marriage, maybe. Um, anyway, great to be back and welcome back, everyone, also to the uh, troublesome, uh, terrific and sometimes tipsy terms. Yep. <laughs> That was a nice callback. <laughs> we'll, we'll give Jonathan a minute to, right, what do you to mean? calm down. <laughs> well, well, warn me when I'm drinking tea, people, please. <laughs> well, you shouldn't be drinking well, tea at all during the interview. he's a teetotaler. That's so funny. He drinks tea, of course. And of course, we have uh, the man without whom there would be no troublesome terps, Alexander Drexler. Oh, that's so lovely of you to say. It was your idea, after all. I'm, I'm just pulling levers in the background. Anyway, it's, it's lovely to see you all, and it's wonderful to have uh, two guests for the price of one. Was that a spoiler? I don't know. We shall see. <laughs> in, in any case, I would like to welcome another Alexander on our panel, Alexander Gansmeyer, who joins us from the Alps. Uh, at least that's what's in his Zoom background at the moment. He joins us from beautiful Munich, as usual. Good evening, Alex. That's right. Yes, it's great to be here, guys. It's great to talk to you. And our very special guest host for the day, who we're going to introduce in just a moment. And it's it's nice to just talk to a few, as I said in the Slack earlier, just a few normal people, just, you know, just a just normal for conversation <laughs> with normal people, just for once. And then I got laughed at on the Slack, but it's okay. I'm, I love being here. <laughs> and also, we did Zoom and Slack before it was cool, right? We yeah. surely did. Just just pointing that out. <laughs> Total pioneers. Absolutely. Jonathan. I've got an apple pie in my left ear and a cherry pie in my right ear. That's not the right line, Jonathan. (laughs) You have to introduce the guest. Sorry. (laughs) It's okay. Going so well. I can win. It's a pandemic. It's okay. You got to do what you got to (laughs) do. Yes, but this isn't coming out during the pandemic, is Uh, it? Well, we don't know. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure it is. Probably. And of course, she who needs no pre-written bio what, whatsoever, Julia. That was a pro move. <laughs> that, that was, was almost even move. an interpreting move. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Hello, Julia. Lovely to have you on. Finally. Finally. It's good. Thank you so much. I am having the best time just sitting here talking to you guys. Let the games begin. We're spending all our days on Zoom, you know, at the moment anyway, so might as well do it and record a podcast while we're at it. <laughs> Now I can see it. <laughs> I'm glad, Jonathan. I'm really glad. The rain, okay, the rain so, is gone. <laughs> so let's kick this off. Uh, Julia, tell us uh, a bit more about yourself. Oh, Where gosh. to start? Well, um, I wear several hats nowadays. Um, I am a freelance interpreter with English A, Russian B, and French C. And... Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, that means, yes, I do actually work into Russian um, during the meetings, in the booth, even. Mala, I can fact, that. That's right. I was going to say, I, I was <laughs> even hired by one of you to do so. Uh, so that's my main work. And then I also work as an interpreter trainer. So I teach uh, both in the Zurich School, the Winter Thirst mm-hmm. School. And then I volunteer teach the Belgian school sometimes with with my man, my partner in crime, in teaching crime, Chris. And um, I also teach at the Cambridge Conference Interpretation Course, which is a two-week interpreter's boot camp. 
and um, yes, definitely a boot camp. Uh, it happens every August, and then I also uh, teach seminars on marketing and negotiating for interpreters called Know Your but Worth. But it's a boot camp in a good way, right? <laughs> that, yeah. that took a little too long. <laughs> I'm just thinking, is Stockholm Syndrome yeah, a good thing on your or perspective, not? I think. Because they all love us at yeah. the end. I think they do. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's, the end. that's fair to say. Um, do you want to? Talk, should we talk a little bit about the Cambridge courses? I feel like they are well known, but uh, maybe they are not. When did when did you start doing those? By the way, um, well, the Cambridge course started back in 1984. It was founded by Chris's boss at the time, um, Michael Francis, and Chris joined him just a few years after that. And so it's an annual two week interpreting course. At the time, uh, Michael would get together with some of his friends and teachers and invite a bunch of students uh, who paid their way, but, you know, who came and worked between French and English. And then it slowly added other languages. And then Michael retired and gave the course to Chris, basically. And that was a couple of years after we had met and married. And Chris asked if I wanted to take it over with him. And I said, yes. And so it's been growing by leaps and bounds ever since. We have space for 27 students and um, 10 to 12 teachers, depending on the language combinations and the language breakdowns. So it's about two and a half, two and a half students to one teacher. Last two weeks, a lot of simultaneous interpreting, a little bit of consec, very little, <laughs> Alex Gansmar. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> Um, and all sorts of other kind of meta exercises. Um, Chris does uh, classes on how do you interpret literature, mm. uh, classes on so Shakespeare and the Bible. The, the, the usual stuff yeah. it, that speakers <laughs> use. Yeah. Well, speakers yeah, misuse exactly. all the time. Actually, mm -hmm. you wouldn't you wouldn't believe how often it, Shakespeare is actually yeah. coming out of your mouth. We should probably point out, by the way, uh, when we talk about Chris, we talk about Chris Fortis, who is a staff interpreter at NATO. So for those of you who don't know him, I don't know if there's anybody who doesn't know Chris, but just making sure. Um, <laughs> right. Just we, in case. But I forgot to ask you one yeah. question. I think I've never asked you this even when we just talked. How did you get into Russian? Or maybe you have told me, but tell, tell the audience. How did mm -hmm. you get into Russian? Well... Um, when I was, when I grew up in Vermont, my school system didn't really have any exotic languages. We had French or Spanish. And I started French in, in sixth grade and Spanish in, in ninth grade. And we had a substitute teacher who came in one day and said, I'm not going to bother with the French or the Spanish. I can't remember which <laughs> class it was, but I'll teach you all how to say hello in Russian. <laughs> and I was hooked. <laughs> No, actually, we had the full oh, okay. yeah. with all of with all of the silent <laughs> letters and so on uh, stuff on the board. Uh, and then, so when I got to university, I figured I didn't want to do anything easy anymore. I wanted something really hard, so I did advanced placement French and um, and Russian. I started Russian yeah. and enjoyed it immensely. I went to summer school for it and um, studied my butt off as you do for Russian to yeah. be able to. As one does, yes. <laughs> I heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've heard me speak it anyway. Yes. <laughs> that is very true, yeah. At speed in very the booth. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that you're really well known for, Julia, is the Know Your Worth workshop. And that really seems to have exploded in the past couple of years. Could you give us a bit about the background of that and how that came about? Sure. Um, well, you find out a little bit about this on the seminars, but I was... Um, I've been working in sales since I was 12, and um, because in the States you can work for your family starting at 12, and I've been um, selling newspaper ads for my mother's That's newspaper. That's amazing. <laughs> um, she ran she ran a, a monthly newspaper out of our out of our town, um, and Chris is Hi, Chris. Us, so you know. Hi, Chris. Hi, Hello. <laughs> um, so. Uh, my parents ran this newspaper and they needed somebody to sell ads. So I started selling ads and then I sold books and I sold shoes and, you know, paid my way through high school, got my, my junior 
you know, my, my little month abroad in high school, um, paid for it that way. And then I went uh, to, to college and kept working in bookstores and shoe stores and so on. And I got my degree in interpreting and just took the sales mentality over to interpreting and was mm. astonished that nobody else was doing it. You know, that nobody else was selling and nobody else knew how to sell. So when we started the Cambridge course together, I started giving the, those extra classes like Chris's literature yeah. in interpreting. Mine was on marketing and negotiating. Yeah. And a couple of the teachers said, you should turn this into an actual class. Yeah. And so I did. And so my first one was in Paris. It was the first France training, IEC France training effort was, was Know Your Worth. And then the month after that, I went to Germany and did it in um, Cologne with Almuta. Yeah, I was there too. Yeah, you were. I remember. And um, yeah, and then it just started getting bigger and bigger. I, my third one was in St. Petersburg in Russia, mm. which was quite serendipitous because we were supposed to be going somewhere else, but the person who was organizing it wasn't a very good organizer and basically wasn't able to advertise it out enough. So I, I offered it to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but we were depending on her local contacts. Mm. So I couldn't really do anything about it. So I passed it on to Tatiana Kaplun, who was in the booth with me uh, at I that same it. conference. Oh, it's a small world, isn't it? She is. And we saw her too in, um, in Geneva. In Geneva yeah. we did. Yep, she yes. was there. Yep. And it she has been organizing world. it with me ever since. She is my brain. I outsource my brain directly to Tatiana. She walks in a room and I become <laughs> stupid for anything practical. I hope other she listens to this. Good choice, Tom. <laughs> Oh, she you'll will. make her listen. <laughs> In fact, uh, she'll listen to it when she'll listen to it when you send it to me before everybody else. So she gets she gets to double check. <laughs> That's what went wrong with me during the intro. <laughs> I love it. But it's become really international. Didn't yeah. you also go to some fancy island too? We went to the Canaries. Wow! In fact, this there in fact go. just a month before lockdown. Aren't you in luck? Perfect. <laughs> no, we've been we've been to, we've been all over. I got to go to Brazil. I got to go to Mexico, um, the States a couple of times, Montreal, uh, and Russia several times, France a couple of times, the Netherlands, and I've got some offers to go to Prague, China, and back to Mexico again, if this ever stops, the quarantine wow. ever stops. Which is honestly amazing. I mean, it's a great workshop, but just the fact that it blew up the way that it did is just yeah. astounding. Congratulations I can, on I that. can see why, though, because I've seen the same thing as you, that most of the interpreters that I know are used to being responsive, which is they wait for work to come to them. Exactly. There are only a very few interpreters that I know who are actually out there marketing and selling and even talking to clients. I remember once, one of my first jobs, um, I was working with an interpreter who got scandalized that during lunch break, I went to chat with the clients. Hmm. Like, well, I'm I'm here for them, um, and it, it's this it's been this shift in like people like you and a couple of other people that I've come across that have shifted my mentality from let the work come to act, to actually no go go find it go get it. I I actually want to just jump in for a second there mm -hmm. because um, one of the things that I make a really big deal about during the seminars is that we have clients and we have customers. And I realize mm. it's my own it's my own categorization, but it's mm. just so that people understand. And I know that people listening now will, will understand as well because they've been following the seminars. But clients are the ones who pay us mm. and customers are the ones who listen to us. And they can be the same thing. Yep. But if you want to, they each have different needs. Mm. And so talking to the customers is one thing, and then talking to the clients is also a different mm. kind of I think that's a very valuable thing to be yeah. aware of, literally, I think. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've certainly been in rooms where the person who paid was nowhere to be seen, and the people who needed the services were right there. Yeah. And, and that, that changes. Who was it? Someone talk, talk to me, taught me about the, the idea of a value chain and the idea of a purchasing chain. And when you understand how that works, it's easier to sell. Mm -hmm. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I'm happy to learn. 
Well, it, it was just um, someone was talking. To, I, I got really frustrated once that no one was biting, and someone in the business world came up to me and said, "So, do you know you're speaking to the right people?" I said, "What do you mean the right people?" He said, "Well, there's a person who signs off on the decision, and the person who actually yeah. makes the decision, and they're not always the same person." And understanding what the interpreting's for, who's buying it, who's signing it, um, and it was a business person who taught me about the fact that of that you don't need to sell to everyone in the company; you need to sell to the right people. That's very that, true. That's been something that really rung in my head. Of, okay, let's understand. Let's try and work out what their buying process is, and get to the person who's making the decision. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. In fact, I was just, I was taking a class this morning, a class I actually paid for, and um, um, from somebody I follow on LinkedIn who does sales and has a sales boot camp for cold calling. And one of the things he said that really rang true to me is that when you're out prospecting for people, that you're looking for people who will experience the problem that you fix at some point, but they may not be experiencing it right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you're not selling to everybody and you're not selling to every, you know, you're just not selling what you're mm. doing all the time. Yeah. You're just trying to figure out who's experiencing the problem when. Mm. Yeah. I had a, a client that I, that I have been talking to for two years. And it's only now they've come to me and said, can we get a quote? And I thought, two years but that's how long it takes sometimes for a client to actually be in a position where now we want to buy and it's great when when they ask you for a quote and you find out that you're the only person they're asking it's it's in a, a nice position to be in mm -hmm. for sure especially if they remember you even two years down the line do you know what yeah. i mean because then you must have clearly done something right for them to remember you all this time and then come back to you and then get the quote yeah and and even when i said you know what you're asking for I said it's a very high value service. The kind of interpreters you're looking for are quite rare to find. They went, oh, it's okay, just name the price. I thought, yes. <laughs> it's a deserved win. <laughs> you're waiting for you for my entire career. <laughs> no, but the know your worth is really good. I thought even when back then when I when I went there, there are some things where you think once you once somebody tells you them, you're mm. like, Oh, this makes total sense. Why have I not been doing this or that? But then you mm. don't actually think of it yourself. But then once somebody tells you, it's just like scales from your eyes. It's just like, oh my God, yes, of course. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of us felt like that back then. Oh, mm. good. And you only, you did the one day version, right? I did. I did, I did yeah. the one and a half day version. The one and a half day yeah. Right. Okay. Because of the DFD. Right. But we had, yeah, now it's a, a big, you know, all singing, all dancing, two day version. This is all actual <laughs> dancing. <laughs> Then I'll come. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be too surprised, no. honestly. <laughs> no, but I, but it does involve me actually being on my feet the entire time because otherwise you know, I just can't keep oh, yeah. the energy going. That. So <laughs> That has not changed. <laughs> no, that hasn't changed. Um, oh, God, that's true. I was like, what, eight hours in front of you guys? That For was sure. Amazing. You were a bouncy ball throughout all the groups, everywhere. <laughs> you were working the room and then you were even working throughout dinner. You, you know, you were like at work in the crowd. You were entertaining everybody. It was, yeah. I don't know how you do it. Well, Lots of you coffee? know, it's <laughs> now actually I'm not a coffee right. drinker at all. It's it's you guys. You give me the Aww. energy. I've, That's I've a very marketing now. thing to say. I have to. I, have to say. <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> no, but really, the first time I did something on Zoom during this quarantine, I was out like a light afterwards. It was like a forty-five minute um, taster. Mm. And then, you know, a half an hour of questions afterwards. And because I wasn't used to Zoom yet, I was just pouring all this energy into the taster. And so when I turned off, I just turned off. I went mm. to bed, you know. And now I've learned how to get, you know, how to get the feedback from you guys. Mm. So it's not quite as exhausting anymore. But it, I still find mm. it more exhausting mm. than doing on-site stuff because you have this, mm. you know, you have no, just no, much absolutely. more difference in many different ways. So yeah, it is definitely more uh, exhausting. Yeah, and I mean, if I don't, if I'm not actually talking to faces, looking at me and reacting to me, then of course I'm going to be pouring even more energy into it. Yeah, yeah so for sure. Interpreting, obviously, they're not going to be looking at me, and so I'm going to be pouring so much energy in mm. that that's going to be exhausting. But when you interpret, at least you get you know maybe a nod or something, like, or you just see that the meeting is is going well. 
So you get yeah. some kind of feedback. Whereas yeah. some, sometimes in online stuff, you just speak into the void and you hope that it's, it's, it's somebody's listening out there, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. But then I have a question which is not related to today's episode at all. So we might just cut that out. But it's actually really interesting because Alex and Julia, you guys are doing uh, webinars as well uh, every now and so again. Do you guys prefer to see every. Oh, oh Sarah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, everybody but me, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, so a question to, question to the group then. Do you guys prefer in webinars, let's say it's like 30 people, um, which is like a regular webinar kind of group? And um, do you guys prefer seeing everybody's video on or off on off everybody <laughs> on I, on i, I <laughs> haven't had the chance to see people with video on oh. yet and i would prefer to have it on but on the other hand i now realize so before i was in interpreting i was in radio i did a um, couple months in radio and so i just treat it as if i was on a air. radio yeah. producer and just uh, yeah and, and just a presenter on air and you just go with it right the problem that I find is that when I speak I, in public, I naturally, because I work from notes and not from a script, I naturally adjust as I'm going based on the reactions. And you, but you can't do that online. You can't. No, you, you, no. you won't feel the bounce back, so you don't know if anything that you're saying is landing. And so online, I it's much more video. rehearsed. It's like yeah. you're well, hitting. I always rehearse. No, <laughs> no, yeah, no, but I mean, yeah, for, for, sure. for the for the taster. It's very rehearsed. I mean, it, it's mm. the slides come up. I know what the slides are about, and so I talk about what what's being said. And and there there isn't so much interaction, but I still want to see the faces looking at me. But the webinar that I'm doing now, the we're calling it the lockdown webinar or the <laughs> lockdown seminar. <laughs> so it's four separate webinars, Monday through Thursday, f from like four to six. And um, and because I'm capping it at about ten or eleven people. I want everybody's face. And, mm. it, and if, if they're not there, when I'm sharing my screen and I don't see them, I tend to run off at the mouth. And when I stop sharing the screen and I bring them all back, I tend to remember, oh, yeah, this is supposed to be interactive. Do you feel similarly, <laughs> uh, Sarah? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, we do webinars with, uh, at NIMSI with quite a lot of people. I mean, maybe not every mm. time at last, it's definitely more than 100 people. And uh, I've never done a webinar where I could see people's faces, but I always wish I could because it always feels super strange to just talk into the void. And I just try to, but I, I try to ignore it, like put it out of my head. And also, yeah, I, I used to work in radio for three and a half years. So I just imagine it like that as well. Like Jonathan said, it's just a sort of radio, a little different, but uh, you're just doing that performance. But it's, I, mm. I find it super odd that you don't get any feedback until like the very end when you can read mm. the comments or people uh, bring up questions. So you can't really play off people's reactions, which yeah, is it's similar for Josh and me, uh, but we do different formats. I think for a traditional webinar, it's fine if you don't see people. So it's more of a presentation, I guess. But if it's a more of an online course, I think then, of course, you want video from people. But that's the advantage of having two panelists or two presenters is that you can bounce off each other. Uh, I mean, we not only help mm. each other out, but we also have, you know, we give each other energy if you want to put it like that. So that's that's fun, too. And, and I guess I also the big advantages there that do, that one of you guys can sort of yeah. um, monitor the chat and the other one can do the because yeah. because I as a as an attendee given that I don't do webinars um, I always find it incredibly irritating if everybody has their video turned yeah. on and I actually like will actively go on like let's say the webinar is on Zoom I will actively go into some other tab or like open another file because I just can't have like forty five <laughs> people even when I even totally when I get it speaker yeah. view you know. You'll, you'll see like the little row of people and then like one of them yeah. picking their nose and the other it's one is picking their teeth and I don't know. It's I have never irritating. seen anybody so ill-mannered. Oh my God, I can send yet. you screenshots that I've taken during webinars. <laughs> you would die. Are you going to use them it's for blackmail or something? Point, the confidentiality. Yeah. <laughs> say that again? I'm sure that's a breach of something. <laughs> oh no, I'm going to blur out like the face and the names and just have like the finger and the nose. No, no, it's okay. You can keep it. I don't think I need to see that one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. but anyways, that was like a complete detour. The, the, the um, but I felt like it was like appropriate and very timely at the moment. But well, to say, I, to, actually, to, 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 to say, to follow up what you said to Alex um, Drexel there, Tanya does that for me. So she's on every one of my webinar seminars. And so she's monitoring the chat and she's making sure I see the questions and she's making sure um, mm. that I don't miss something in all of my, you know, perorations. So that's great. 
by the time this comes out, I will have already done another 20 minute session this time for BP conference, which is one of my favorite conferences to go to. And I'm actually talking about, you know, my adventures in client land. And for this one, I'm doing something different because I'm beginning to think that with webinars, we rely too much on PowerPoint. So I'm going to do this entire talk slide free. It's just going to be me. I'm going to use my best camera so that they can see me properly. Because I think sometimes we over rely on certain tools and I understand the importance of PowerPoint and I understand how it's used well in webinars. But I think sometimes to see to just see someone's face is really powerful and you can actually get a lot across with your face and your body that's hidden even if your kind of camera even if your video is down at a corner. So I'm going to try something completely without webinars but this uh, without slides but this actually does bring us back to the topic in that i'm seeing interpreters do more and more in terms of getting information out there to try and win clients um is that a marketing strategy that you would talk about that you would advise people to use julia or would you kind of advise interpreters you know stand back a minute and wait and, and do something else this idea of giving away information for free that the clients can use Oh, no, no. God, yes. I mean, this is this is the only way to advertise now, now and now and then nowadays. There we go. It's the only <laughs> way to advertise nowadays. Because really, people, how are they going to find you if you're not putting out content? And I hate to use the word content because it's such a buzzword now. But if you're not somewhere saying something, how is anybody going to ever find you? I mean, when I started out interpreting, it was sending out CVs and I went to, you know, conferences and got the participant list and then would just mail bomb everybody, but like actual licking envelopes and, and stamps and stuff. And when I worked for the US government and they had high enough level delegations, the Russian embassy would always send somebody along and you can bet that they got my card because Americans are like super, hey, I need an interpreter. I'm going to call the Russian embassy and get one. And they did. And all of the people at the embassy on the economic desk had my card. So it wasn't hard. But nowadays, you can't do that. I mean, I don't see the same people. You don't hang around in the same places, but you are online. And as we were all noting before, you know, if we didn't know each other actually in person, we know each other pretty well from online, mm. those of us here. And so if there was something that I absolutely needed, you know, Alex, well, I do it all the time. I call him. Oh, you tweet at me. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's my, <laughs> I tweet it, I tweet at him. I, I tweet at you. Yes. And to you, um, sometimes even openly <laughs> saying help and, you know, and that's how you make your contacts. If you don't offer help to people and if you don't offer them help before they need it before they realize they need it, how are they going to know that you're there to help them when like they do need it? That especially applies online. It's just be uh, helpful, useful, friendly, I guess. Yeah. Simple things, really. Yeah. I, I, I had someone say to me once, you know, um, I couldn't ever write content for clients or I couldn't ever give advice to clients. And I pointed out to them that 90% of the advice and 90% of the questions that I'm asked by client, potential clients at meetings are the kind of things that any interpreter who has finished their training could answer. You know, like, how many interpreters do I need? Or what's the difference between interpreting and translation? Or I've got this meeting coming up. How would I set up interpreting? We all know how to do that. And I'm amazed that sometimes how few interpreters are willing even to write the basics. And people say, you know, the basics have been written. But actually, the basics might have been written, but the clients that you're aiming at might not know where they are and might not know how to find them. And it's amazing how much just talking to people about the basics can actually be a really good introduction. Mm -hmm. That is very true. Yeah. Which might be actually a good segue since we're announcing segues in, in recent episodes Do we? to um, the Do we? Uh, various posts you've made on the IEQ web scene. Well, I feel like it's a good thing, you know, for people to know. <laughs> This it's is where good. we're at now. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's good. You know, the articles you wrote in the IEG webzine, the business of interpreting um, yeah. FAQs. So you wrote, I believe it's about 10 of them. I think 11 uh, now. Yeah, 11 now. Yeah. yeah. And that's also packed with information about, you know, the business, the clients, just anything you can really imagine. How did that come about? Did you just approach IEG and say, listen, I know you guys know nothing about marketing and business. <laughs> Let me teach you. <laughs> Actually, no, like, well, 
like it happened with the know your worth thing um you know somebody said to me i should i should set up a seminar so i did i was actually approached by um Luigi Lucarelli, who is the head of the of the web scene at the time, and we've known each other for donkey's years. I mean, I, I used to know him a little bit back in the States. And when I moved here, he was one of the first AIC members I met. And um, he knew that I write that, that I talk about business. And he said, why don't you write an article for us about business side? Because nobody does that. And I said, okay, that sounds good. What do you want? How long, you know, give me some criteria because I could just go on for a book, you know, or something. And he said, no, okay, about this length and so on. And and when I handed it in, he said, hey, let's make it an FAQ. And so that's how the series started. So um, if they look good and they read well, then it's thanks to Luigi because I had no idea what He's I was doing He's a great editor, in the that's true. Yeah. He's fantastic. He's a brilliant editor. And now I have to write them without him, the last couple. So, you know, if anybody notices any huge differences and definitely quality going down, Shout out to Luigi, Luigi <laughs> isn't there anymore. <laughs> I mean, some of these questions are brilliant. Things like, you know, how can I get more work? Everyone's asking that, especially now. But it's interesting. I've noticed a lot of interpreters discussing this thing of why do I need to be a brand? And it's really interesting to have conversations about interpreters who think that, you know, being a, a good interpreter is enough. How would you explain to interpreters, you know, we'll, we'll post the article on the in the show notes, but how would you explain to interpreters really quickly, you know, over wine or coffee or something, if they say, you know, I've heard about all this branding stuff, I don't get it, isn't it just enough to be good? How would you answer that question? Oh, gosh. That would be a big cup of coffee or a really large glass of wine. I have to admit. Um, basically, a brand is a promise fulfilled, right? So McDonald's, not to equate them at all with high-level interpreting, but just it's an easy brand. Anywhere you go in the world, you're going to get the same thing, right? And I will pull out my little party piece and say, to all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun, and there's your Big Mac anywhere you go. I am not going to sing it for you, however. And, um, we'll do that after the show. And so that, <laughs> when I see that the recording is gone, yes. <laughs> but in any case, um, you know, anywhere you go in the world, and this is why McDonald's is so popular. I mean, I had clients who would come to Moscow and they'd be so afraid of drinking the water or eating the food because they really just didn't know anything. They'd never been outside the U.S. before. And so they would go and have breakfast, lunch and dinner at McDonald's because it was something they knew and they knew exactly what they were going to get. And that's what a brand is. That's all it is. It's not everything. It's not salads. It's not, you know, the healthier stuff. It's not even the chicken McNuggets or the milkshakes. It I'd could love be a milkshake, milkshake right now. Any, Thank you, Julia. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I, I'm going to crave my milkshake for later. But it's, it's the burgers which does it. And so that's what they're advertising all the time. And so a brand, it's the same thing. You're just advertising the essence they don't need to know that you don't wake up until noon that you're a fan of science fiction um that or or fantasy that you know you uh like designer clothes and i'm describing myself here what they need to know is you know what they need to know for the work mm -hmm. only and while they'll get to know me they'll get to know my taste in music possibly or my taste in literature if you consider science fiction literature which of course i do but you know, I know there's some hardcore people out there. Don't who email don't. us. <laughs> Looking a little bit possibly. <laughs> is one of them no, sitting no, behind Chris you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. He actually, he actually likes sci-fi too. Well. <laughs> that's true. He's a William Gibson fan as well. So in the in the in the science fiction world, and um, you know, they'll get to know that. But that's not what I'm going to advertise. Mm. And that that really interests me because. I'm in a market where there aren't too many interpreters, but in my combination, there are certainly more than two. And yes. so in some cases, most of the time, I'm the first interpreter that people have ever met, and that's lovely. And then you don't have to do a lot of brand building because you're building brand interpreting. But there have been some cases where I've been like the fourth or fifth French to English interpreter that someone's met. Mm -hmm. And then you have the question that I know is in the back of people's minds, well, how are you different? And it's one of the things I've really been thinking through about a few of my colleagues have been worried about being replaced by remote or replaced by that. And it's what is it in your brand 
and I'm asking myself this all the time, what is it in my brand that means that they can't just, you know, lift me out of the room and replace another interpreter and everything would be identical? Mm -hmm. And that that's an interesting question. It's one I'm still working on. And it's, it's an interesting thinking of sales from that angle of what is it that I do that's different to the other French and English interpreters in my city, in my country? Or in the world. Well, Considering at the moment we're in the middle of quarantine and your your competition could come from yeah, anywhere. Yeah, now we Not had this discussion on Twitter the other day, right? I mean, this this is the big question that pops up now: is what's what's different about you compared to the guy from Bangladesh? I don't know, whatever. I think that's a very interesting discussion to have because you have to strike a balance as an interpreter of telling your client, "This is who I am. This is what you're getting. This is what I, only I can give you." and being careful of not throwing everybody else under the bus because you might be the best person for the job, but you might not be the only person who can do the job. So if I say, you have me, this is what I can do. I can give you the best service, but Alex Drexel will be complete crap. That's not true. He could do an, a really great job too. But just because I've been working with the client for 10 years now, you know, I know them, he might still do a great job. I'm just better for it. So I think you have to really, especially in the... Not necessarily when it's a new client, because then obviously they're getting to know you, so you just can go all, go all out. Um, but I think especially when it's a client you've been working with, you kind of need to still remind them sometimes of what they have with you without bad-mouthing anybody else. And I think that's a very, str a very um, delicate balance that you have to strike here. Two thumbs up. Two thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I paid attention. <laughs> in, in, in you a did. In a sense, it means that we're building two brands at the same time. We're building our personal brand and we're also building brand interpreting all the time. I like that. Thought. And I'm becoming yeah. very aware of... I think a lot of people... Uh, are I like of that. that we, we, well, well, this is where, I mean, we had an interesting discussion on Twitter once about, you know, interpreters and doing public relations. And I realized in other places it's called advocacy. But my angle was, if I go to a business meeting, whether it's online or... Um, I was going to say the real world, but online is real as well. But, you know, whether it's online or physical, they'll, if I'm saying I'm an interpreter, then I'm representing me and I'm representing interpreting. And if I don't get both right, then I've misrepresented one of the two. And I think interpreters traditionally have been quite good in many places at representing brand, brand interpreting and not very good at representing yeah, sometimes brand the other way and around, vice versa. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, sure. I, I had one person tell me once, you're the first friendly interpreter I've ever met. And I oh thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's totally sad. sad. <laughs> it happens more than you think. Um, I was just wondering as well, though, in, or this is something I think about sometimes with, um, you know, making yourself stand out, um, building your own brand and what makes you, you and why people should hire you. It's like how much can you even differentiate uh, yourself you know when yeah you're saying hey i offer the best service but everyone will say hey i offer the best service you know and like i'm a really good interpreter well everyone will say i'm a really good interpreter so come to the seminar every website. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> come to the seminar <laughs> you'll know how then but it's not just i mean it's not just you're interpreting i mean you're interpreting they wouldn't have called you if you weren't an interpreter they yeah, know you're exactly. an interpreter and yeah. they know you're an interpreter of, of whatever Irish or German that you have to <laughs> Definitely be doing. Definitely not Irish. <laughs> I can't believe it's not butter. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they, they absolutely know that you're an interpreter. And so that's not what you're selling anyway. Yeah, no, exactly. But like, uh, that's what I mean. You know, how, how much as an interpreter can you uh, differentiate yourself like that much from other interpreters? You, you can. Know, so. You can. I think because, a whole bunch. Yeah. yeah. Because so, you're different. Mm -hmm. You're not the same. I mean, you, you know, maybe you hate science fiction or jazz. You know, maybe you <laughs> I like actually don't. Else. I like both. <laughs> okay, well, then, then, then we're the same. Okay, that's it. You and I are twins separated at birth. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I didn't know you spoke it. Russian, Sarah. That's so impressive. <laughs> Secretly on the down low. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, a, a, a simple example is I have, I know quite a few very good German interpreters, but I know two German interpreters who I would trust absolutely in any technical or legal meeting where any technical or legal conference, I would send them without even thinking. I would not put them near a sales meeting. 
No, and to me, not. that's differentiation is I know some interpreters who are fantastic with technical stuff and you wouldn't put them in a, a motivational speech. You wouldn't put them in a sales meeting. And so actually there's, there's you know, scope for interpreters to say, I'm a conference interpreter and I'm really, really good at when you need to get the crowd enthusiastic and energetic. And my favorite booth mate is amazing at finance stuff. So we always arrange the shift so that the finance talk lands on her shift because she's a fine she's amazing you get her a cup of coffee <laughs> in knowing that yeah i get her a big cup of coffee and a- any pastry she wants she can have i'm sorry you absent yourself from the booth during no, numbers no no no, no, no. I'm, I'm always there <laughs> but if, it, if it's hardcore finance she takes it whereas she doesn't like doing artsy fartsy motivational people so we look at the agenda and try to work it out so that our shift falls at the right time, but I would never absent myself from the booth when my colleague is active unless it's absolutely necessary. <laughs> okay. So you're more talking about basically uh, specializations, playing to your strength in that sense. That not only, no, right. not just that, but there's all sorts of ways that you differentiate. I mean, one of the things that um, we do during the, the lockdown seminar, um, since we have more time with with each other as opposed to the two-day seminar, which is still not enough time, um, is we really explore some of the ways that we're all very different from each other just as human beings. And that does make a difference. Now, um, I just I did listen to Jonathan's talk a week ago or two weeks ago on prose. I can't remember anymore. Time has has just melted together. Time you know? is a flat circle. But I listened mm. to his talk on prose. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I listened to his talk on prison. One of the things that um, he said, you said, Jonathan, since I'm talking actually to your picture right here, is um, was your confusion about and the, the whole misunderstanding about you're selling you, right? And you said you're not selling yourself because... Um, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting whatever it is, and you have to divide yourself off from that. And I agree with that, but you are selling you in the sense that if you weren't where you were saying what you've been saying to the clients, if you haven't, if it's not you as opposed to me or somebody else, you know, that client is going to love you or hate you or whatever based on you. I mean, I know interpreters who I can't stand Right. I mean, we all know somebody like that, but they have fans like rabid fans. Right. And they would never hire me. They would only hire this other person, which for which, please, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly happy. I don't need to have every client under the sun. But so you are selling yourself in that sense. But the job offer that you're selling is not you. OK, yeah. so it's, it's your it's your personality that's getting you in the door. It's the fact that you're assertive enough to get yourself past a gatekeeper, whereas maybe somebody else isn't as assertive to yeah. get past that gatekeeper. So you, therefore, are selling yourself. It's just the job offer that's mm. getting rejected, not you as a person. So I wanted to make sure after yeah. having heard what you said on prose, I wanted to bring that up. Yeah, and it's an interesting point of, you know, your your personality as part of your brand and the, the way that you talk as part of your brand. Of course. And it, it's really important for people to understand. I mean, I remember Valeria Aliperta giving me a lecture once saying, everything you do is your brand. And at the time I thought, that's weird. But now I realize, you know, how I sign off an email, how I approach people, the the wording that I use, people begin to associate that with me. Mm-hmm. Of and course. that's, you know, you don't want to be hypersensitive and think, you know, have I used the word and too many times? But the reality is that there are some clients that I will attract because of the way that I act and other clients that I will turn off because of the way I act. It's, but it's, we all have that. I mean, we all have rabid fans somewhere for something. I mean, like I may have a rabid fan um, for Know Your Worth and somebody who absolutely hates my interpreting, for example. Example. I mean, I don't know them, not personally, <laughs> or at least they haven't made themselves known to me. But um, but I'm sure that, that that there are. I mean, we're all polarizing in some way, right? That's and that's sure. not a bad thing. No, because in the end, that carves out your own niche, then, right? Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite quotes that I like to use during the seminar now is from Dolly Parton, where it says, "You know, find out, um, find what is it? Find out who you are and do it on purpose." Mm. And boy, does yes. she do that. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And 
She I'm so it. hoping that I do too. Just I'm <laughs> who I am and I'm not Dolly Parton. I do yeah. not have that singing voice. <laughs> Neither the outfit and I don't think uh, yeah. any of or us. Or the accent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, she is who she is and that's great. So aren't um, we all Southern at heart to a, to a point when we get to that accent? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, come back now, you hear? <laughs> on, on, on the topic of, you know, the job offering things, you, you wrote this really good post in that FAQ on how do I win the bid? And can oh. you clarify for the people listening that winning the bid doesn't necessarily mean being lowest price? Because I've, I've come across a lot of people who say, I'm going to lose work during the pandemic because all my clients are going to go for cheaper interpreters. Could you explain what it means to win the bid and what it takes to win a bid? Yeah. Okay. So the the article itself, I mean, you can read it, but I'll, I'll just do a, a quick summary. Basically, it's talking about the difference between when somebody calls you and they've never heard of you, or they, obviously they've heard of you, they called you, and they've never spoken to you before, and they have no relationship with you or whatsoever, whatsoever and they ask you, in this case, it was for a legal thing. Um, are you available? What's your rate? Um, and then they ghost you, right? That's it. They're done. And somebody else called for a completely different day, different assignment, exactly the same assignment, the same kind of thing. And they had been referred to me by somebody they trusted. And the person who referred me trusted me. And so when they called, they just said, are you available on this date? Can you and your team come and work? And I'm like, my team, lovely, excellent. I've got work for other people. This is good. <laughs> and, you know, and of course I've already, you know, have a team that I've worked with, so this is good. And, and she didn't even ask my rate until after we had all said yes and yes. And she only found it out, you know, three email exchanges down the road two months later when she got the contract. You know, and she didn't care because she trusted me. And so in that sense, I'm not bidding because she that's all reflected trust, right? And so she came to me for that. In the first instance... I was obviously bidding because there was no relationship, there was no trust, there was no no. There, I mean, there was no no, really. They, they didn't know me, so they couldn't like me, they couldn't trust me. They just called up somebody out of the blue that had the right language combination that they could find either online or you know through whoever. And they said, what are your rates? And I gave them, you know, whenever anybody does that, I always give my highest possible rate, um, which is one that I have actually worked for, never a rate that I have not worked for, but I always give my highest possible rate because damn it, they need to hear it. And even if they're going to hire somebody for less than half of that, they need to hear that there are people out there who are, who are giving numbers that are that high. And I figured, you know, I could sit there and try and get them. But on the other hand, this kind of client isn't the kind to sit there and talk, you know, for a while. They obviously had somebody in mind already. And I'm not going to fight that. Again, I don't, I don't have to be interpreting for everybody. I'm not perfect for everybody. And, and I'm not chasing after everybody either. Does that then come? Sorry, Alex. Don't go ahead, Jonathan. I was just going to ask, because I've had that a few times in the past couple of years where I've had the first email has been a request for quote. And at the beginning, I thought that was a, a really, I thought that was gold, you know, great. They're looking for a quote straight away. They're not wasting my time. Now I'm beginning to read that as a danger sign <laughs> because yes. it tends to be they're asking for a quote because they're, they've are they been sent out by a manager somewhere to get three quotes and pick the lowest. And now, whereas before I used to think, great, they're shortcutting the process. This is going to be an easy conversation. I found that the jobs I've won have never been the, can you send me a quote jobs? They've always been a... I've got this issue, can you help me? Or I've heard from so-and-so, can you do it? Those are the ones that I tend to win rather than the, uh, you know, can I get a quote? Exactly. I, I actually asked a, a salesman once, I said, what do you do with those? Do you bother responding? And one of the salesmen that I met at a business networking meeting from a fairly large company, so I don't know how applicable his advice is, his advice was that instead of replying with a quote, he says, who's asked you to, to get a quote and how many are you looking for? And he said, as soon as he hears a number greater than one, he then asks, and what would make my, my, my quote win? And if it's price, he just walks straight out. And rightly so. And I thought I had never thought of, rather than responding with a quote or, or sending a, you know, a brief for them to fill in, just saying, who's actually asking and how many are you looking for? And I thought, I need to start using that. Mm -hmm. Those are just the beginning questions you should be asking. There are all sorts of different questions you could ask. 
many of them, I mean, beyond the ones that are obvious, like, oh, what languages and, you know, how many booths and, and so, I mean, those are the obvious ones, right? We all know about those. And do I need a passport to get there and so on, um, which sometimes you do. Uh, but there are so many other questions that one could ask, like those, you know, how many other people are bidding? Um, is it only price that you're going with? Now, why? Um, how courageous of you to only go for price, for example. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> how incredibly courageous of you. Good luck and have fun. <laughs> I actually have a colleague in the U.S. who every time the market slows down for her, raises her rates. And you know, she hit, Yeah, and it works for her. It works for her. And anytime anybody calls her and, she's, and they say, oh, my God, you know, that's so high and that's fine. Um, I'll be happy to let you go and work with somebody who doesn't charge as much as I do. That's fine. But you know my rate if you call back. And she gets the jobs. She it hits. works for Apple. Yeah. She hit exactly. <laughs> Price is never an obstacle. If, if somebody wanted, really wants you. Exactly. If they want it, they will always find the price. Mm -hmm. If they don't want it, if they want some cheaper, then they're going to find somebody cheaper than you anyways. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't matter how great you are. They're just going to find somebody cheaper. And there's always somebody cheaper. And there is always somebody cheaper. I Not know just people, right now during the lockdown, even during regular. People you know. pay to interpret at places sometimes. I mean, that's ridiculous. So, you know. That is quite, <laughs> I mean, yeah. 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 So talking about this pandemic, um, there's this question of, is it okay to do marketing during the pandemic? And... I would want to extend that to how do you do appropriate marketing during the pandemic? Ah, well, of course you should be marketing during the pandemic and you should be selling and everything else because this is, this is you know, everybody's talking about how the economy is going to, to tank. And if we don't keep selling and we don't keep the money flowing, then the economy will tank and a lot of people will suffer from that. A lot of people. I mean, if I'm not paying my taxes, then the government doesn't have the money to help the people who are a lot poorer than I am. You know, the, the whole solidarity thing. So, yes, you do need to keep going, but you need to do it in a non-tone deaf way. Right. So keep in mind where you are, when you are and how you're having to get in touch with people now. You know, it's only the phone or Zoom or or any other, you know, web conferencing app and it's not going out and meeting people and shaking their hands and are we ever going to get back to shaking hands do you think i, I mean, hope seriously? so oh my god i hope so. i don't care about shaking hands but i want to hug people again exactly exactly <laughs> yeah so i could see the other alex sitting here and hugging everybody <laughs> virtually it's great <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well it is, so as soon as this is over i'm going to buy a free hugs t-shirt <laughs> oh, that's actually a nice idea. <laughs> you could order one now and keep the economy going, dear, and then have it ready for the day you walk out your door. <laughs> so you see, you see, I've just helped you. And that was marketing. Always be helpful. If you, if you, if you open a free hugs t-shirt company, I'll know exactly what's going on, Julia. <laughs> oh, come on. You can find a t-shirt company near you that'll kids, print it you know? for you. Yeah. Think globally, act locally. <laughs> Exactly. Well said. Think globally, act locally. So anyway, you, yes, you do have to market and you do and you should be marketing. And in fact, if you haven't called your clients yet to make sure that they're OK, and I'm seeing faces going, hmm, have I made those calls yet? Um, you know, then then they're going to remember that you let them fall during a difficult time. And so they're not going to bother to call you back when they get back up on their feet. So if nothing else, you should at least be asking them how they're doing mm. with nothing, you know, no, what is the, the word in English now? Agenda. <laughs> you know, yeah, thank you. No agenda. I, mm. I have Chris next to me. I'm only thinking in French now. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, as long as you can do that. And then possibly you could come up with something that might help them out now. Mm. You know. I think a lot of people underestimate during the during the pandemic, you know, actually contacting your clients. And we talked about this during the last episode when we were talking to the ATA about Corona and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. But, you know, actually considering what are the technical options at the moment? What do my clients usually need? What are the usual meetings or conferences or 
whatever you interpret, and then thinking what applies to whom, how can I make this work, and then actually going out there and talking to them about it and not necessarily advertising it, but just saying, hey, this is what we have right now. This is the solution mm -hmm. I can offer you. And just reminding them that you're here and you're also thinking for them. Mm -hmm. And then exactly. even if they don't book you, it still leaves a good impression. Exactly. Well, I had, I had one of my favorite direct clients. Uh, they were talking about getting me, it was a job coming up over the summer, which has had to be canceled due to, to COVID-19 and coronavirus. And I, for the first time in my career, I I was able to follow that process through watching, not watching them make a decision, but, you know, I was able to email them regularly and get updates. And because I was interested enough and because I showed interest in actually helping them, my name was then passed up the chain to people higher up who do other events that I could interpret at. And I thought it, it's, it's simple things like checking how you are saying, oh, I see we had that conference coming up. I've got a solution if you want. And it's like, this is really simple things but it's simple things that make a big difference. Um, and it is, I'm amazed how much of marketing and sales is just doing the simple things and doing them regularly. Mm -hmm. mm, for sure. Consistency. That's the, that's the absolute must. That's the one thing you have to have is consistency. So I have a question to switch gears a little bit here, but still sticking with the pandemic, because what else are we going to do at this point in time? Um, so we've talked about, you know, how to do marketing during the pandemic, but then a lot of people have, not everybody, but a lot of people have some spare time during the pandemic. And, you know, they're wondering, what can I do? How can I actually fill my calendar? How can I fill my time? How can I spend my time productively? But then also, how can I practice my business acumen productively? So is there actually any way of practicing your negotiations, your kind of quotes, you know, all those things without, quote unquote, practicing or gambling on real clients? You know what I mean? Like, can we actually do something about our business savvy during the pandemic? Um, okay, this is going to be cheeky. Except for, of course, visiting your uh, webinars and obviously, that obviously, obviously. Well, that, that's an obvious. Thing. But but <laughs> we'll but link just, to it in the show notes. <laughs> I know you will. I know you will. No, but I'm gonna. But you, you, I have to say this because you just you you brought it up so perfectly. It's like, well, just like you don't want to practice a new language combination on the backs of your clients, so you come to the Cambridge Conference Interpretation Course, you don't want to practice some really bad techniques in marketing without first coming to the know your work. Class. Bow down to the master, everybody. <laughs> yes, but in any in any case, um, well, there's you can always you can always try some role playing with your colleagues, like as as you guys have been advocates of, you know, anonymized. And can I just re reinforce this anonymized client stories? You know, things that give zero away about the clients, because I am all about client confidentiality. And we can get into that one, too, if you want. And please, 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 can we actually mention the hashtag client authorized at some point as well? That would be good. Um, so one of the things that you, you know, that, and now I've lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? Uh <laughs> The question was how we can practice our. I love you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, during uh, the pandemic, yeah, I don't talk a lot today, but I listen. <laughs> but you're doing really well <laughs> because you know you're you're right there when I need you. Thank you. I told you when I think about Tanya, I get stupid about everything. Um, so you you know you can you can talk to your colleagues and use these anonymized stories and say, well, what would you do? And you take my role and I'll take the client role and maybe I'll discover something about the client that I wouldn't have known, which I know for a fact has helped people in the past um, because at least one person has told me directly that that's what they did and they were able to have much smoother sales conversations afterwards. Um, you can also get online and um, find a, a couple of, you know, find people who talk about negotiating stories or something and see if you can figure out the answer before they get to the end or something like that. Um, I was reading a book once and they were talking about, you know, okay, so what would you do here? And I'm like, well, I would do this. And then they're like, well, most of you would say this. And I'm like, no, no, that's not what I would do. But the real person would do this. And I'm I'm like, yes, I've been reading these books long enough. I've started to figure it out. So, you know, you can read and you can practice and you can practice with each other. Um, we do a little tiny bit of role playing in the two-day seminar. We haven't really had a chance to do it in the webinar yet, but we're thinking of starting it next week. So at least, you know, one or two exercises there. 
Um, but why not? Why can't you guys do that the same way that PIPS works with the, you know, or IBPG works with young professional interpreters who want to keep practicing their, their work when, when they're not getting any work, obviously, because nobody's getting any work. Um, you know, PIPS has now hit their 100 person limit and IBPG is more and more popular all the time. And instead of getting together to practice your your interpreting, why not get together to practice your negotiating and so on? Mm -hmm. It's a muscle that you will lose if you don't use it. Yeah. And I also, use it all the time. Also, it's amazing to watch what's going on in client land at the moment. I've been watching, so an area that I'm kind of trying to grow my clientele in is the international event sector. And I thought they would be silent at the moment, but actually they're more creative than I could have possibly been imagine them to, to be able to follow what they're doing means that I can work to get myself in the place that when they're booking remote interpreting or in-person interpreting, I can speak the language that they've been speaking mm -hmm. and understand what it is they're looking for. And, and it's spending the time, sometimes you don't need to put content out, but to be able to listen to the content that people have been putting out and, you know, reading what they're saying, understanding the debates. It's like, actually, I think you become smarter when you listen than when you speak. Obviously, definitely. But but the Which thing is, is but the thing is though is that you that. have to speak. Otherwise, they're not going to know that you've been listening. So yeah. You yeah, and you also speak. have nothing to say without having listened first. So. <laughs> I don't know if you've met the people I've met. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, you have nothing to say. Yeah. Technically. So. <laughs> Moving away a little bit from, you know, the practicing in the pandemic and just going into just like regular, whatever what regular is going to be more? going forward. So I guess we can never really move away from the pandemic, can we? But just, uh, I know, what does it even mean? What is normal? Um, it's not us. <laughs> that is for sure. Because, because but that's why we're having a great time on this podcast. So we are, go. aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We Who are wants to be normal individual. anyways? Exactly. So uh, generally speaking, a lot of people, and I mean, it's come up time and time again tonight, is, is just price. Because a lot of people think negotiating and just business and getting the contract is always about price. So if we move away from the figure and the highest and the lowest and whatever, there's a lot of different pricing models and pricing ideas that are floating out there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I feel like interpreters are just kind of hung up on, this is my day rate, this is the overtime rate, this is what I get for when you record me, and this is my approach, and this is my, I don't know, overtime, whatever have you, whatever else have you, um, which has worked well for a lot of people for a lot of years, but there's a lot of very, innov I don't want to say innovative because that already sounds, that already glorifies it, but there's a lot of new ways of thinking about pricing structures mm -hmm. so do you have any any opinions do you have any favorite things that you've heard mm -hmm. so far i mean we have a few written down here so we can just throw them out there and then discuss them if you want but i just wanted to give you like carte blanche to just talk about whatever you want first well of first of all pricing is not pricing is not the only thing that they're looking at in a negotiation so you've got a huge leeway on things like um, you know, do you get an extra day travel or do you not, you know, and, and so on. So there's all sorts of things, plus the working conditions. You could be negotiating on absolutely anything on your contract and it doesn't have to only be price. And price is not fixed when they're coming to you either because they can always take a little bit from this budget line item and a little bit from that budget line item and put them together to, to make your price. It's happened to me many times. But I do think that the day rate idea is rather harmful. And it's something that I think has been undermining us for years, but it's it's kind of like, like received of wisdom. Sorry, but you know, way back in the old days when interpreters yeah, exactly. I mean, including our rates. I mean, especially our rates too. But, but you know, back in the old days, people started doing this, and so they handed it down, and so people still keep doing it. And they haven't been thinking, but some interpreters have started coming up with ways of explaining their rates to clients that are actually acceptable. So, for example, I know one interpreter who says, well, when I explain that my day rate actually includes my preparation time, suddenly they don't mind paying the day rate. And I'm like, well, why are you still calling it a day rate? Why isn't it your project rate? 
I love calling it that. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, and every project is different. So obviously you're not going to have, you know, a project rate on your, on your website. It, I mean, it's hard when you have a day rate, you can put your day rate up, but you have to maybe tell them what the day rate includes. Mm. And quite frankly, when I have days where I have to prepare three days for every one day that I'm mm. interpreting, you know, I want my, yeah, French legal is hell. <laughs> you know, I want my, I want my rate to be as high as it possibly can get, yeah. you know, because I don't want to be making a, a dollar a day, you know, and, and all right. So in Julia land during the seminars and so on, because Julia is such crap at math. <laughs> Right. So in Julia land, we always talk during our seminars that a, a regular working day will say is eight hours just because that's what everybody thinks. And so you're going to be getting 800 for that working day because it's really easy to divide up and say that an hour is just 100. Right. My math is really that bad. So, um, you know, there's nothing to say that you, you can't say, OK, well, this project is 800. And it includes, you know, my prep time, my this, my that, my travel, and so on and so forth. And then, oh, well, can you reduce it a bit? I'm like, well, certainly I could. Let me break the fee down for you. Mm. And so I'm going to have, okay, there's the travel time. So it's going to take me an hour to get to work and an hour back. And then you want me there half an hour in advance. So that's two and a half hours. So that's already, you know, that's two and a half hours. I'm going to be working for you for eight hours. I'm going to be prepping for you for this. I'm going to be doing this. And of course, if we do it hourly, I, I start charging the minute I leave my door. Yeah. So all of this comes out to being, hmm, same project, 1300. So shall we do that? Or which bit do you want me not to do? I want travel. I want prep. What do you want me not to do? Mm. And what do you want me to do? And then they're like, oh, well, 800 sounds really good. <laughs> you know? and so that's fine. But, you know, that's one way of approaching it. But I mean, I've been, I've been doing that for years because the, the, we had an issue with the tax people in the States. We're still having an issue. But back then we solved it for a while where they were wanting to classify us all as employees of various mm. agencies, which is happening in California right now. And it's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And I'm really hoping that by the time this airs, that everything is resolved in mm. favor of the interpreters because it, people are losing their livelihoods just because of this law. But anyway, so the, the tax people at the time were saying um, you can't only fix rates at days. I mean, you have to fix rates at other ways and, and so on. You have to be different from everybody else. And I'm like, okay, I've got an hourly rate. So my hourly rate is 400 and I have a minimum rate of two hours. And so there you go, how much time? And I charge for when I leave the door or I can give you my project rate of 800 for the, <laughs> you know, for the day. And so why not? Because it does include so much more and people are just not explaining what, they're, what it includes. That is and, very true. And it also means that your hourly rate doesn't have to be 100 because there are eight hours in a day mm -hmm. and you're charging 800 for that whole day. You know, mm -hmm. your hourly rate is not 100. Your hourly rate is possibly 400, mm -hmm. but you don't do more than one of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. And I mean, you know, even a even an hourly rate of 400 isn't outrageous because if you look at consultants or lawyers, they 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 commend those fees handily all the time and nobody bats an eye. <laughs> but then as soon as you say my project fee or my interpreting fee or whatever fee is this and that they're saying, oh, and this is just for, you're just speaking German, you're just speaking English, you're just speaking right. French. How, how is this possible? And then you explain it to them. Yeah. And then it either goes well or they're just saying, well, no, we can get it cheaper. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, I'm sure you can. Good luck and have, have fun. How courageous of you. Start exactly. Using that. How courageous really good. They hate being courageous. They're really scared. <laughs> but, the, but the other thing with but, that, though, <laughs> the other thing with that, though, is that, is that um, you know, first of all, it's partly your fault because you, you haven't really explained the value that you bring to them, right? But it's also partly their fault in that they haven't really understood what it is they're looking for. You know, I mean, we know what they're looking for, but we can't prove it to them. They have to be brought about along to understand that the reason they're asking for interpreters is so that people can actually understand each other and mm -hmm. exchange ideas and speak to each other. And so if that's not the goal of the meeting, then you're, you know, you're SOL, let some cheap guy take it because really that's not what they want. <laughs> you know, they want something completely different. 
So I took a second to get what that meant. So yeah. out of luck. Um, <laughs> I can it, spell it, it out very, for you if you like. No, 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 it's, it's all good. It's all good. But yes, so out of luck. That's exactly. <laughs> I it. mean, it, you've thought of that one. <laughs> it, it really struck me once how strange our rates were when I did a, a job and this is a very anonymized client story I did the job and at the end of my interpreting it, it wasn't technically a conference interpreting job it was a business interpreting job at the end of two days the clients had agreed on a deal worth a seven figure sum and I looked at the amount of money that I had taken home for two days of work and I thought I've ripped myself off Mm -hmm. Because the CEO of one of the companies told me at the end of the job, it was because of you that we were to, able to do that deal. Did he put it in writing? I wish he did. <laughs> um, and why didn't he? Because I forgot to ask him. Uh -huh. <laughs> also because it was an agency job. So there were, I went to the agency afterwards and said, you need to approach this client for a recommendation because they are over the moon. And I got an email saying, we'll look into it. And I thought at that moment, I realized something has to give and I will never fall into that mistake again because I realized that that's the kind of client that if, if, they'd, if they had been able to put in writing, we did a seven figure deal because of Jonathan, my marketing's done for me for I don't know how long. And it's that, you know, understanding that, you know, even if I charged a hundred times what I charged as a percentage of what they're making, it's not huge. And you think, hmm, I missed something there. Well, that's one of the questions you need to ask them beforehand too, is, is for example, when they're, when they're pushing back on price, you're like, well, how much money have you laid out on this thing already? You know, you've spent how many days and how many hours and, and how many whatever's on negotiating this deal and you've written up the contract and you've had it, I'm assuming professionally translated. I mean, I hope you didn't go to the local students, but that's happened in the past. And oh my God, that leads to another story. But, um, <laughs> and, and so you're willing to risk all of that money because of a couple hundred euros? You know, that doesn't seem to be good business sense. So the story, it on. just so you have it, because God only knows if you use it, but why not? Um, I was in Boston and I was accompanying a group of um, Russians, I don't remember why, and we were having lunch with a lawyer who was sitting across from me and he said, I think you guys are just, you know, you're all crap, you're not any good, it's just a whole bunch of smoke and mirrors. And I said, really, what leads you to think that? And he said, well, we did these great negotiations with this other client and, you know, from this other country and, and um, on Russia actually, it was with Russia. And he said, and we had the deal translated and they didn't go for it. And I said, okay, so who did you have translate it? And he said, well, we contacted Harvard and got one of the students there. And I said, uh-huh. And so you expected to have a better result from that? And he's like, well, what do you mean? And I said, I'll tell you what. I watch LA Law and Ally McBeal and all of these other legal things. I'm going to hang my shingle out on the road right next to your law firm. And I'm going to answer all of the questions that they want to ask me. Because <laughs> believe me, I can sound just like you. And I can do everything that you can do except for going into court. And I'm charging 20 bucks an hour. And he winced. And I said, uh-huh. If you need a really good professional next time, I can put, point you to somebody. But otherwise, you know, I know you're not calling me, that's for sure. But there are some good professionals in Boston and you should use them. And so I, I, I stormed. <laughs> well, I didn't storm. I, I, oh, I, 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 <laughs> I know you're worth to out. <laughs> have no, a new verb. That is it started great. early. <laughs> <laughs> I know my worth out of that situation. <laughs> That is great. It, just, just a little side note, in that seven-figure deal, you will never believe what nearly lost in the deal was because they translated something in-house and didn't get professionals to do it. Mm. And so there, there came a question where both sides were misunderstanding and they were getting really upset. And I did my usual, excuse me, the interpreter believes there's been a misunderstanding, briefly explained what I thought the misunderstanding was, left them to resolve it. Two hours later, pre-contract signed. I thought, you know, that wouldn't have even have happened if they, but it's, yeah, professionals all the way down, it has to be. For sure. 
I just want to say, so we have two more questions, but I just want to say one more thing real quick before we move on, because one of my pet peeves is with interpreters. And we've had this in a, diff in a few different um, bar camps and also in a few different workshops where people are hesitant or downright reluctant to talk about their the money, whatever you want to call it, project fee, interpreting fee, daily fee, hourly fee, whatever. They just don't want to give you a number when a client calls you. And then I was saying, well, but if the client calls you for a number, you should give them a range at, at the very least, because if the only reason I'm calling you is I want to know why you're doing or what you're charging for what you're doing, I'm going to explain to you what I'm doing. I'm going to ask you for what you want to do. If you can give me the, the answer for I'm doing this event, I'm doing XYZ for that event, I can give you a, a more precise number. If you say, we have an event, we need German, and you have nothing else, and I say, well, it can range from 800 to 2,000. You know, like there is a huge range. So the more information you can give me, the more you can hone in. But one of my pet peeves is people just literally not just refusing to give the client the one piece of information that they called you for because that is not client friendly. You might not want to talk about the money. You might give them a huge range and then say, if you give me more information, I can specify the offer. But if you can give me any information, the range is just from here to there. But yeah. just give them something because that's why they're calling you for. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the pieces of information they're calling you for. They're all, I mean, they're, they, I, I agree with the clients. It, sorry. I agree with the colleagues who think that they, that they should be talking to the client more so oh, that they can, sure. get, you know, they can get more information and, and with you as well. Yeah. yeah. But some of the information that you're going to want isn't necessarily going to be just what kind of event and, you know, how many languages and so on and so forth, there's going to, there's a little bit of a longer conversation to have there. And if they're not willing to have that conversation, then yeah, give them a rate and make sure that you give them a really, you know, a, exactly. a, a decent range, but make sure that that lowest rate is fairly high because you, you know, yes. you may have to work for it. Yeah. And you might have to they be may negotiating. decide to take you. Exactly. And you don't want to hate them for paying you so little because you only asked for so little. Absolutely not. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, but that was just one thing that I just had to get off my chest before we move on to those last two questions that we really... Oh, wait, 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 except for I wanted to, I wanted to make ahead. sure to talk about the hashtag. Oh, the hashtag. That's yeah. right. Let's talk okay. about the hashtag. Um, because we had, well, because we had this discussion in Lyon, right, um, with Alex and, and there were several of us there. And we were having a parallel discussion on Twitter at the same time that we were having the discussion in the room. <laughs> I talk about splitting attention, you know. And one of the things that came out of that is that, yes, of course, we do need to be saying certain things about ourselves, our jobs, and so on and so forth, certain things, not giving away confidential information um, about our jobs and things like that. But the problem is, is that sometimes our clients are actually asking us to do that. I know that the European Parliament likes their interpreters to be putting things out about things that they're doing so that they have a better, you know, they have a better um, image out in the world. And so what I'd like to advocate, and I've kind of started a little bit among our Know Yours people, but is a hashtag called client authorized so that when you actually have the client's permission, you put it down. Because otherwise, let's pretend Alex Drexel's you know, institution wants him to tweet about stuff at the institution and he starts doing it. And then Jonathan sees it and says, oh, what a great idea and starts just tweeting out what he wants to tweet out from his client. And then Alex Gansmeyer sees that and starts to, you know, and, and it becomes this, this, you know, there goes the, the dike of confidentiality. The dam has been burst. <laughs> and whereas if, if all of us knew that Alex Drexel's boss wanted him to do this because he put the hashtag on, then we would know that we can't just do it without actually getting a client authorization. Mm -hmm. So I am, I am very much in favor of this because I do know that we're, we're playing to different constituencies. You know, as I said earlier, we've got the clients are the ones who pay us. The customers are the ones who listen to us. Our colleagues are also the ones who hire us. Mm -hmm. And it's usually our colleagues who are on our social media when you know where we're putting this stuff out there and so you know you kind of want them to know that yes you can interpret but you better also let them know that the client was okay with you putting that information out mm -hmm. there i've seen far too many stupid tweets 
and photographs on Facebook of booths with documents where you can see where the person is and what they're interpreting about and they're commenting on it and then or they're showing a goodie bag and what's in the goodie bag and it's just like how much industrial espionage is being carried out just by looking <laughs> at your Facebook feed? And it's even trickier now, you know, with uh, screenshots from Zoom calls and oh, stuff yes. like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Hashtag one in T hush. Oh, the, the, in in my second book, I actually point out the fact that we need something alongside one NT hush because on the one hand, we need confidentiality. On the other hand, people need to understand what interpreting is and the difference that interpreting makes. So I like this this idea of client authorized. And I like the idea that, you know, it's okay to have conversations with clients if they're going to be writing about the event in, you know, some magazine anyway or, at, you know, doing a big splash on it. It's worth saying, you know, it's okay to mention the interpreting team. Um, and to, to me, it's it's a, a smart conversation. It's not always a conversation you can have because sometimes the person who's hiring you isn't the person who needs you, and we've already had that. But to have that conversation that says, you know, if you're writing it up anyway, could we, you know, borrow something from the write-up or whatever? And I, it wasn't an event I was interpreting at, but I was at an event once. And I, I wrote it up knowing that they were okay with me writing it up. And they loved my write-up so much that they adopted it as their write-up of their event. And I thought, hmm, this is interesting. And, and, and they said, you know, you were so perceptive at, at what was said and what was missed. I'm like, it's like, yes, because that's my job as an interpreter to be perceptive about what is said and what. <laughs> and, and suddenly you have this conversation. They're like, so you can train to do that? It's like, yes. <laughs> Can I just say, I'm sorry, you remembered what you interpreted as? I no, no. <laughs> was what I was saying. <laughs> I, I, it was not, I have to say very clearly, it was not an event that I was interpreting at. It was an event I attended. Very okay. rarely can I ever remember what I interpreted. And there are some events, I don't know about anyone else, but the events that I remember what I interpreted are usually the ones I wish I could forget. <laughs> That's an excellent point. So... Uh, maybe moving on to one of our last questions here, um, especially these days, of course, um, a lot of uh, there, there are a lot of uh, events with uh, remote simultaneous interpreting, even uh, out of necessity, mostly, I guess, uh, these days. Um, so we already talked about interpreter pricing. Um, what, do you, what do you think that people should be mindful um, of when it comes to RSI pricing? When it comes to RSI pricing in general? Um, yes. RSI pricing actually... Like I said before, it's not 800 divided by eight to get 100. I mean, it can't be just that for your hourly rate because you're doing exactly the same job as you'd be doing in a booth. And so quite frankly, if I were charging 800 for my hour in the booth and I'm going to charge, you know, I'm going to want to charge 800 for my hour on the RSI mic. Now, obviously, that's not necessarily a sustainable model with people that I don't have a deep relationship with that already trust me and understand the value that I bring to them. Um, I, I do have a bit of a, a pet peeve at the moment, or maybe not a pet peeve, but something that I've noticed really clearly at the moment about the pricing. And that is that there are two very different markets that are talking about RSI. There are two constituencies. One is the interpreters who are, you know, I'm, I'm very involved on Twitter with people who know a lot about platforms and they're all saying, oh my God, it's so much harder. I charge more for it. I don't charge hourly or whatever, you know, but they definitely charge more. And it's, and, and just from being on Zoom, I'm exhausted, you know, so I, I understand that it, it's harder and so it should require more money. On the other hand, you get the platforms which quite frankly should just be consoles. I mean, it's not like your Brailler console or your Philips console or your Televic console is hiring you, right? And so here they're, they're consoles, but they're also trying to act like <laughs> agencies, a little bit like on the Belgian market when they like to sell cabine garni, you know, garnish, booths with garnish. The piece that gets stuck between the teeth. Right? <laughs> so, um, so they like to do that here. That's what they do. <laughs> Let's get that out. Okay. Um, you know, and so the platforms are trying to also act like agencies and they're saying, but it's so much easier and you don't have to leave and we're going to have just one hour. And so therefore you need an hourly rate and you have to do it alone um, and so on and, you know, and so on and so forth. And so they're really putting a lot of pressure on us 
to work in conditions that we would never accept if this were not the pandemic. Mm. And so we have to, all of us have to remember that whatever we agree to now is basically your life from now on, <laughs> because you will never agree. You will never get a client who has paid you only a hundred for an hour to ever pay you much more than that, mm. that you might get them in 10 years up to 200. Mm but you're never going to get them up to 400 or 500 when you're back out and you're traveling. There's, oh, but you only charged a hundred when you were at home. Hmm. Right. So whatever hmm. you do now is going to, is going to affect you from every day forward. So whatever you do, make sure you have a really good um, what's the, reasoning. But this is a good one it. because so many people keep talking, I mean, not just pricing, but also RSI in general. And yeah, we have to explain to the customer slash client that this is just for now. This is just, this is just Corona. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not happening. It's folks. not. Yeah, that's not yeah. how it works. And also, yeah. I wonder if as, as interpreters, the more time I spend in client land, the more I realize, and this will sound obvious, but clients don't think like interpreters. And so to clients, it doesn't massively matter, you know, trying to sell your remote, your RSI price based on it's harder or whatever. It's not really what they're not buying how hard it is. They're buying what it does for them. And to get back to, you know, the value that interpreting is for them. And I wouldn't want to have a conversation with a client saying, you know, I'm charging for this because it's hard. I want to have a conversation saying for what you want to achieve, this is what it takes. And so this is the price. Mm -hmm. And right. I, want, yeah. I wonder if too often as interpreters, we're so fixated on what it takes for us to do the job. You know, that's why we think about day rates and paired DMs and travels and stuff. And actually, s certainly some of the clients that I've come across probably couldn't even spell paired DM. They don't care. It's all about, can you get the job done and how much does it cost? And if we could get to that place of saying, okay, the client are wanting this, they realize that, you know, if they're negotiating online it's going to be harder you know what are they trying to achieve what their skills bring negotiate on that basis don't go to the client and say it's rsi it's harder it's like why does that matter to them why should it matter to them right no one of the things that i completely agree like one of the things that i always say to the client if they ask well can we do this can we do that can we do it like this can we do it like that i said we can do whatever you want like everything is possible Everything is possible somehow, somewhere, some when we'll get it done. It's just a matter of how much are you willing to pay? How much can we put into that project? But sure, everything is possible. Anything is possible for you. We'll make it possible. It's just a matter That's of how right we there. get it done. And what are you willing to pay for it? Ah, uh, I just, I had an... That's the case. But you know, I'm also thinking because you know, I, I get emails from people and I follow people all over the place that are not interpreters. This is the first piece of advice I have for everybody. Stop just talking to interpreters, please. It's not helping. And one of the things that that which of course doesn't help me tonight. What could I say? <laughs> <laughs> but you're my friends. It's just us girls tonight. It's fine. That's true. That's true. But anyway, so so one of the emails that I just got was, you know, where you say, Oh, I'll be happy to work within your budget. Not a problem, you know. And it's like, ooh, bend over and let me kick you again. Um, <laughs> but, okay, I have a feeling that might have gotten that might get me carried away a bit. No, this but, is amazing. This is this is like the what is it, Alex? Like at the beginning, like of the teaser. This is what, <laughs> what comes in. <laughs> bend over and kick me again. There we go. I gave it to you twice. Um, and this and and on the other hand, what you could say is is well. Um, if you give me more information, then I can give you a, a firm quote. But if you don't have all the information, tell me your budget and I'll prepare a firm quote for you within that budget. So that's not saying I'll work for anything. That's saying I'll do a certain amount of what I do for you, but within the budget. And I, I just got this email like two days ago, and I'm really, really happy, happy for that. Um, and I can't wait to see the gift you get for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a feeling I know what's going out on Twitter now <laughs> with the subtitles and everything. <laughs> but, but, but this is the thing is that there's being flexible and being helpful and there's being an idiot. And I know myself a couple of times, I've not so much with interpreting, I must say, but when I used to do translation, a couple of times I fell for the idiot. And now I realize why you should never fall for being an idiot. 
no matter how tempting it is. Because if you're, I, I had one client and I did a silly thing once, and you're right, once a client's got you for a knockdown rate, they're not going to budge for a long, long time. And the only way to get a higher rate is to kick the client. But I think everybody does that. I mean, especially when you're starting out, everybody gets um, that one client and, you know, that just gets them where you just do some work for some rate that you normally, that you in hindsight wouldn't do again. But at the time, it feels like the right thing to do. And you're like, yes, and I have a client and this is great. Let's do it. But I think everybody has it. And I don't, don't think if you learn from it, I don't think it's anything to be ashamed of. I think if you don't learn from it, it's it's... It needs some work. So we should probably uh, take this puppy to bed, wrap this show up, put a bow on it, uh, whichever metaphor you like. And we had this big question that we were going to ask everyone. And Alex, the I want you to answer first because you've been so quiet. Yes. <laughs> what is, what and then Alex, and, and then you're not going to ask me about business strategies, are you? So, so, of course, so, yes. uh, Alex Drexel, as the joint co-owner of the world's best interpreter webinar company <laughs> organization. Now you're laying it on thick. <laughs> um, what's your favorite business strategy or tip? This is simple. I mean, we, we're doing this because we want to help people, literally. So we're just trying to be helpful. Oh, that doesn't count. That's so lame. <laughs> that's like that's such a Captain America I answer. We're not going to take I my shield. I got my shield Captain right America. there. You know? Look at him. I know he's got the shield right there. Oh, oh no, he, he he's Captain EU. No, that, yeah, that which, exactly. which is exactly like Captain with America, only with background. good health care. <laughs> oh, Captain, that's already taken. Captain Europe is already taken. Uh, no, sorry. I think that's that's all you're going to get from me tonight. I'm afraid. <laughs> Well, if you can cut out some of the other stuff that shouldn't have been said, then that's a lot already that you've been contributing tonight. (laughs) Yes, for sure. Sarah, what about you? Uh, I have to admit that when it comes to interpreting, I don't have a business strategy yet. I'm uh, yet looking to adopt one and um, need to make an effort in that area, actually. Uh, But I would uh, think that it's mostly just about like, well, not all about, but about being visible, you know, being yeah. as visible as you can, the kind of uh, be there approach. Like with, uh, you want to eventually be in that um, top of mind kind of um, state for the client. But of course it takes, I would assume, a long time to get there. Can I just add one thing to redeem myself? <laughs> it's okay. Go ahead, Captain. I, there's this one phrase from, uh, from an author called Kel Newport, I think, yeah. which is be so good they can't ignore you. That's what we're doing. I just kind of like it, and I think it works. That's a mic drop, but we still have three more people to go, so you should have said that later. <laughs> I'll, I'll fix that in post again. <laughs> we'll fix it, it in he'll post. be the last one in, 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 on the podcast. You got it. It'll be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> he usually gets the last word, so that's okay. Omnipotence. Um, <laughs> Thy name is Alex Drexel. <laughs> but before I, already. before I throw it over to you, Jonathan, and, and then obviously, Julia, you're going to get the last word on today's episode. Um, my favorite business tip is actually one that I that I talked to you about, Julia, back then in Cologne, and it's the walk away. So sometimes you don't actually, like not every client is for you. And I keep saying this in this episode, not every job is for everyone. So sometimes you just got to say, listen, if you're looking for somebody for 50 euros for a day, Maybe it's just not going to work out for us this time. I'm looking forward to working for you, with you next time. And good luck. And, and what were we always saying? Um, that's very brave of you. Courageous. That's very courageous. Nobody ever wants to be courageous. There you go. So sometimes it just feels very empowering to walk away from a situation. And that's my favorite thing to do. Not necessarily my favorite thing to do, but my favorite tip. That ah, but, but to, to follow up on that for just a second, mm. if you have a walkaway strategy, and you have an alternative to what you're doing, you know, to, to whatever mm-hmm. it is that you're going to do. A hundred percent of the time you will get what you want because you either get that spa day or that marketing time, or you get the job, but a hundred percent of the time you get what you want. Mm-hmm. JD, what's your favorite? So Sarah kind of stole my visibility thing. And I, I want to give a strange one that Julie will probably tell me off for, but I realized that my marketing got, more successful and got better responses and got more fun when I realized that I could be me. And actually, the 
the opportunities that I've had in the past two years, not all of them interpreting. Interpreting has been quiet for a while over here, uh, for a long while. But when I realized that I could mark it as me, that I could allow my weirdness to come out, that made life so much more fun. It, it, it made me free to say no to jobs. It made me free to go, actually, this is how I'm going to do it. I don't need to follow anyone's strategy exactly. I can be me. And being me gained me a really good relationship with a client that's now my favorite client because I just love working with them. And I, I think I got them and keep working with them because I'm me. Now, I'm only going to rip you apart because you think that I'm going to rip you apart for that one. <laughs> oh, my God. After everything I said earlier about selling yourself, you're going to tell me that I'm going to get on your case because you want to be more you? I said, mate, it was a model. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm sorry. Alex Drexel, I hope you're going to find the right, you know, the, the right song for that. Yeah, I got to be or something. I you can know? just bleep it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. Bleeping, bleeping. <laughs> so I what can't believe Julia, it. You're, you're, you're up last. Yeah, I am up last, and I have last. far too many your... of them. Just one. What's just Pick one? one. Just that's one. All right. Or just one you used today or yesterday or whatever. The oh yeah, best, that's good. The best one that I like is keep it simple. I love that. Keep it simple. You you don't need to go all bells and whistles the first second the client calls you. You don't need to go all bells and whistles on proposals and everything else. Keep it as simple as you can. Ask a question, let them answer it, and see where it takes you from there. And don't use the jargon that goes along with being an interpreter. Oh, yes. So, you know, keep the language simple. Don't talk down. You know, don't talk to them like they're too... Well, let me explain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't talk mm, to them like people that. People love that. That's why, I, that's why I hate the phrase client education, because it always sounds like this. Yeah, but I mean, I'm client educating right now. I know. But... Basically. Because, because <laughs> so we you didn't know, know you're working now. for Cambridge, you guys are all my clients, you know, or potential clients. So, well, maybe not Alex Drexel. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, he doesn't need us. He's got a job. He's saving <laughs> the world. It's oh. okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's keep it simple. And if you want the, if you want the actual, you know, keep it simple, stupid. And then you can say kiss if you like. That's a, that's a winner. I think right there to wrap things up for tonight. Don't you guys think? Yeah, that's Perfect. a wrap. Just, you'll just, everybody gets a kiss from every one of us. And that's it. <laughs> kiss and a <laughs> kick. It depends how you're doing. <laughs> yeah, was that loud enough? <laughs> That was a nice fact. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, Julia. Oh, well, thank, thank you. you. This you, has Julia. been one of my most fun evenings, possibly ever, not even just in the quarantine. But ever. Aww. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> been mutual <laughs> kiss. Yes. Kiss, kiss kiss lots of kisses <laughs> okay bye everybody it's been bye. awesome bye, bye. have you stuck you are still recording turn it off <laughs> i shall